along the northwest coast of the United States and into Canada is a land of great beauty where ocean, forest and rock live together in harmony. Remote and isolated, all that is usually heard are the sounds of the natural world, the waves, wind, seabirds. But if you listen carefully, you can sometimes hear a song, an ancient song of the people who call this land their home, the people of the Northwest Coast. The people of the Northwest Coast have many names. Nootka, Salish, Kwakutl, Quilcin, Simshian, and many others. Each have different names. Each speak different languages, but they all share a common background. They were and still are a great fishing people, fishing the many rivers and streams that cut through this land. They built great cedar canoes and traveled the ocean and rivers in search of game. They hunted sea mammals, even whales. From the great cedar trees that grow here, they built impressive wooden homes, decorating them with ornate carvings and paintings. They carved totem poles. The symbols represent animals and spirits. They wore clothing woven from the bark of trees as well as animal hides. While the people didn't have a, a written language, they did have rich oral traditions and passed down their legends during ceremonies. They carved wooden masks which often represented supernatural beings important to the history of the people. Ornately carved figures were common in many wooden items. This is a bowl. They also carved stone. This is a small chest. A bowl. From cedar bark, they wove beautiful baskets. They designed ingenious fishing hooks. These have wooden shanks and the barb is carved from bone. Spear and harpoon points were carved from stone, bone and sometimes ivory. A variety of tools were used to work the cedar forests. The coast people were among the first Native Americans to use iron in their tools. The source of the metal may have been Siberia, reaching the northwest coast through trade. But even after they obtained metal, they continued to use stone for some tools. The people felt closely related to all things in the natural world. They felt that everything in the natural world had a spiritual life and that everything was connected to everything else in a spiritual way. Who are the coast people? How did they get here? Where did they come from? While all tribes have their own origin stories, most anthropologists accept the following. About 30,000 years ago, North America looked much as it does today. A narrow stretch of ocean separated Asia from this continent. There were no people living here. Then, ice began to advance across the northern hemisphere. As it did, sea levels dropped, exposing a land bridge connecting Asia with North America. Large game animals like bison and mammoth crossed this land bridge, entering the new continent, soon followed by Asian hunters. There were probably several migrations over thousands of years, and eventually the people spread throughout North and South America, 
as the ice retreated and the land bridge became covered by water again. There were hundreds of tribes, but each can be classified into one of several groups according to the natural environment in which they lived. The names of these groups are the Eastern Woodlands, the Plains, the Southwest, the Great Basin, the Plateau, California, and the Northwest Coast. Each of these groups lived in an environment that was unlike the others. None of the others lived in an environment quite like this one, the Northwest Coast, the land of the coast people. This region consists of dense forests and rugged coastlines. The climate is mild, a lot of rain and little snow. The people who inhabited the coastline became expert at ocean fishing and the hunting of sea mammals, while those who lived inland hunted forest animals and fished the fjords and rivers. What would it have been like to have lived back then? To have lived like the coast people hundreds of years ago? This is the dance of the bear, but it is more than a dance, for it tells a story, a story about our courageous ancestors. The most important part of the dance is when the bear threatens our chief. The chief must ignore the threats, proving to everyone that he is very brave. Bravery is important to our people. Funny, it was never that important to me, until recently. My name is Dashutahi. It means Golden Sparrow. I have lived for 15 winters here with my people, the Gitsan, in the house of the Frog Clan. So why is bravery important to me now? To explain that, I have to tell you a little about our people. We live in a small village along the Shun River in five cedar houses. This is our food storage house. It's built on stilts to help keep it dry during heavy rains and snow. And this is our smokehouse, where we smoke fish to preserve them during the long winters. In front of each house is a pole with many carved figures. One of the figures is very special, like this one, the wolf. This tells everyone that this house belongs to the wolf clan. My clan is the frog, and that's why there's a frog carved in the top beam of our house. Clans share the same houses together. There might be as many as four to five families living in a single house. So it's a good thing our houses are so big. And even here we've carved special figures important to our clan and its history. Our houses are made from cedar logs and planks we cut from our forests. And there's an opening at the top to let out smoke. We sleep along the outside edges of the house. That's my mother tucking in my two younger brothers. Our blankets are bear skins and they are very soft and warm. On one wall in our house is our clan symbol, the frog. So what does all this have to do with bravery? You see, clans are very important to our people. They are like big families, and it is forbidden to marry someone from your own clan. I wanted to marry a boy from the wolf clan. His name is Danawak, and he's kind and caring. But my parents wanted me to marry Danawak's older brother, Jago. Jago was the oldest eligible boy in another clan, so that's who my parents insisted I marry. This is the way of clans, and parents arrange all marriages and everyone has to obey clan rules. When you belong to a clan, you get special privileges, like being able to hunt in clan territory. 
My father is a very good hunter, and he and my brother hunt for deer and elk in our forests. They also set traps and snares. This is a snare. A string is tied to a bent tree. At the other end of the string is a loop. When a small animal runs through the loop, it triggers the snare. This is just a stick, but it could have easily been a rabbit or squirrel. Women do gathering in areas set aside for their clan. We gather fruit and berries and other things that grow in our forest. Wild strawberries are my little sister's favorite. Clans also cut trees in their own areas. Cedar trees are the ones we use to make our houses, poles, and canoes. The men use adzes to start the cut. The blade of the adze my father is using is made of iron, which we get by trading with people far to the north. Iron blades work better than the stone blades we used to use, but tree falling is still hard work. And that's why the men will set a fire in the place cut out for it. The fire will eventually burn its way through the cedar. Next, the men use pounding stones and wedges to split the tree into planks. You can hear the tree splitting. Cedar splits easily when wedged properly. The men may get 50 planks out of a small tree like this one. We use cedar to make lots of things. Sometimes we strip the bark from the cedar. This is done by first making incisions in the bark using a small adze. The bark is then pried away from the cedar. Finally, it is stripped. A good bark stripper, like my father, can strip the bark a long way up. When done properly, stripping does not harm the cedar. The brown outer bark is then stripped away as only the inner bark can be used. Later, the bark strips are soaked in hot water to make them soft and pliable. The strips are laid out and then woven together, one strip going under every other strip. This is the start of a basket. Nina. And this is what the basket looks like when it's nearly complete. The strips are folded back and then tied off with string made from root. My little sister watches every step, for soon she will have to know how to make baskets herself. Bark can also be braided and made into rope, belts, headbands, and even clothing. Several men in our clan are excellent carvers. They carve many things, but some of the most important things they carve are masks. The masks represent supernatural beings and animals important to our clan. They're never used for play, but for special ceremonies. This mask is the wolf. I mentioned how clans have special privileges. Another one is the right to fish in certain areas. One way we fish is with spears. The points are first sharpened with a stone. One man will beat the water with a stick, driving a salmon toward the spear. Then it's up to the spear to have an accurate aim and not let the salmon off the spear. Using the 
this technique, two men should be able to spear enough salmon in one afternoon to feed the entire village. There are a number of ways to cook salmon. One way is by bracing it with sticks and then roasting it over a fire, just far enough away to keep the sticks from burning. This gives the salmon a smoky flavor. Another way to cook salmon is by boiling. A hot rock is placed in a box filled with water. This causes the water to boil. Next, my mother adds green plants, like wild onions. And then, sections of salmon for salmon stew. Salmon stew is not my favorite. Every year, the bones from the first salmon caught must be returned to the water from which they came. We believe that salmon offer themselves to our people so that we may eat them. For this, we must show them great respect. By returning their bones to the water, the salmon will be able to resurrect themselves and return to our people the following year. Our people show respect for everything in the natural world, for we believe everything in nature has a spirit life. As long as we show proper respect, we will lead good and healthy lives and never do without. But there are evil spirits in the world, and when things go wrong, like sickness, it is sometimes because of the evil spirits. Shamans, or medicine men, have been specially trained to deal with illness. When in Many times they use herbs and medicines to cure the sick. But sometimes it is necessary for the shaman to call upon spirit helpers and perform special acts to cleanse and purify the bodies of those who are contaminated. The shaman works very hard, sometimes for days before he is successful. I don't want you to think we never have time for games, because we do. One of my favorite games is foot racing. Another game we play is tug of war. Boys games are a little rougher, like wrestling. And stick fighting teaches boys to become good warriors. There was no question Jago would become a good warrior, and that's who I would have had to have married if Danawak hadn't proved himself. Here's what happened. Our chief had brought his grandson to the forest to show him how cedars were cut. Danawak was the fire tender that day. The chief wanted to give instructions to the men and let the boy alone. Suddenly, the cedar began to fall. Danawak was the first to see it. It's Yatwin! Danawak dove and pushed the boy away just as the tree hit the ground. The boy was shaken up, but he'd be all right. Needless to say, the chief was very thankful his grandson was saved. So thankful, in fact, he talked to my parents telling them how brave Danawak had been that day. My parents were so impressed, they finally agreed to let me marry Danawak instead of Jago. Golden Sparrow and Danawak would eventually marry, but their family would be the last to live entirely in the old ways. A new people, the Europeans, had entered the continent. In just a matter of years, the way of life of native peoples would be forever changed. Wanting the land occupied by Indians, the newcomers engaged in a series of conflicts that would eventually result in the complete conquest of all native peoples. Indians everywhere were forced to give up their way of life and to live on small reservations and reserves, areas of land set aside for Indians. No longer able to hunt and fish in the old ways, the Indians were rationed food and clothing by the government. Some agents who were supposed to help the Indians were dishonest. They stole money and supplies, 
closed so the Indians never got all that they were entitled to. As a result, the Indians lived in total poverty and many starved. Tribes were forced to give up many of their traditions and could no longer perform many of their religious rites and ceremonies. Many Indian children were separated from their families and were sent to strict boarding schools where they were forced to give up their Indian ways. In the 1950s, the United States government encouraged Native Americans to relocate to the nation's cities where they could find jobs and live in modern ways. But not all Indians chose to do this. Today, Indians can live anywhere they want. And many choose to live off reservations in cities and towns, employed in the same sorts of jobs as other Americans. But more than half a million Indians prefer to remain on reservations throughout the United States. Life here is much better than it used to be, and in some ways is similar to life anywhere else. Indians drive cars and live in modern dwellings like other Americans. They shop in stores and wear modern clothing. Many attend Christian churches. Indian children go to schools that look like schools anywhere and study the same kinds of subjects. They enjoy the same sorts of things as other children. While reservation life is a lot like life anywhere else, there are some big differences. Unemployment is very high. On some reservations, four out of five people are out of work. And because of it, alcoholism and poverty are widespread. Many tribes have opened gambling casinos in order to create jobs and bring in additional income. But only a few tribes, those near major cities, have actually profited from casinos. Along the northwest coast, some Indians are fortunate to have jobs in the lumber industry. This mill in British Columbia not only employs a lot of native people, it is one of the few mills that is native owned. That means that most of the money the plant makes stays in the native community, where it is sorely needed. Others find employment in the fishing industry. This work pays a lot, but it's dangerous and only lasts for a few weeks in the summer when the ocean salmon return to their spawning grounds. Some of the fish end up in native-owned canneries and smokehouses like this one in British Columbia. This is a small operation, but it provides important jobs for people who wouldn't have jobs otherwise. Some native people earn modest incomes in more traditional ways. Bark peeling has been a tradition along the northwest coast for thousands of years and it is still being done today. Bark peelers use simple techniques that are similar to those used in the past. Cedar bark can be used to make many things like this basket which will fetch a good price from a tourist. The Haida tribe is famous for its carvings in argillite, black stone that is relatively easy to cut. Haida carvers can earn thousands of dollars for a beautifully carved piece. This sculpture is that of a raven, an important character in Northwest Coast legends and a popular subject of carvers. Other tribes are famous for their carvings in wood. This is a shaman's rattle, a type of rattle shamans used to use during ceremonies. Today, these rattles are favorites among tourists and collectors and command high prices. This carving is an eagle, another popular subject for carvers and collectors. Canoes have been an important part of Northwest Coast life for thousands of years. They were used for transportation, fishing, trading, and war. Today, the canoes are mostly gone. 
but a few native craftsmen are still trying to keep the ancient art of canoe making alive. Using the simple tools of their ancestors, these craftsmen are carving a 52 foot long canoe out of a red cedar log. A canoe like this can take more than a year to make, and when it's done, it will be used in special events and ceremonies. The people of the Northwest Coast have always been identified with the carving of totem poles, and they are still being carved today. Totem poles are carved from a solid red cedar log using simple tools that are very similar to those that have been used for centuries. A pole this size can take a team of carvers months to carve, and when it's done, it will take its place next to poles like these that are found in small native villages throughout the Northwest Coast. While cedar canoes seldom paddle these waters, and you no longer find the great cedar houses. The people, their spirit, and many of their traditions live on.